Hi everyone, this is Intro to Africa. Um, I'm Dr. Young, your instructor. Uh, two things about this recording from the outset. Um, I am fighting a, a really bad cold, and so I may start coughing in the middle of this. Um, I've got cough drops and other things to try to suppress it, but uh, if I have to pause, then my apologies. The other one is I'm recording at home, and there's maybe some background noise. Um, my son is working on a club project, and he's pounding and uh, doing some other things, so um, apologies uh, if there's any, any background noise. Uh, so today's lecture is about South Africa in the 20th century, and we're going to um, backtrack a bit chronologically here back to the early part of the 20th century. Uh, South Africa constitutes a special case. I mean, I suppose every nation in, in Africa is, it has its own unique story. Um, but South Africa, of course, was the most, uh, the, the largest settler colony, at least in terms of um, uh, population, uh, European population. Uh, the settlement, the European settlement of South Africa began in the 17th century. And so this is, you know, has been intimately a part of life in South Africa for much longer um, than it has been in any other part of Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, in the 20th century, um, South Africa was um, an independent country, but uh, it was run by a government of, um, uh, made up entirely of, of white people, made up entirely of people of European origin. Um, and that is uh, a, a unique case. I mean, there were other uh, governments that followed South Africa's lead, uh, you know, Rhodesia, for instance, broke away from the British Empire in the early 1960s and tried to carry on as an independent country under white rule in the 60s and 70s until <coughs> until that government was overthrown um, and independence uh, established in 1980. Um, but, uh, and so there are, you know, some countries kind of like South Africa, uh, but this one, you know, is still, is still a special case, certainly. So when we last discussed South Africa, we talked about the South African War, or the Boer War, as it's otherwise known. And this left a lasting impression on the, uh, particularly the Afrikaner population in South Africa. And I talked about this in the last lecture, um, that, you know, this really solidified their identity as a people, meaning the people, the Afrikaners of South Africa. And even though the British won the war and ended up, you know, in charge of uh, dictating the kind of uh, political future of, of Africa or of South Africa at that point. Now, the Afrikaners were a lot more cohesive as a people. On the other hand, the British um, were to some extent haunted by the choices they made during the South African war. And, you know, in subsequent years, they got involved in things like the Great War in Europe. And so there was a lot um, to distract the British uh, settlers there. Um, and to make them less cohesive than the Afrikaners. Um, that cohesiveness of the Afrikaans population would remain a key factor really all the way till uh, the end of the 20th century. Um, now, at the same time, after the South African War, the economy of South Africa took off. Um, there was you know, this union in 1910 politically, and that union uh, certainly aided the ability of the country to um, produce things, to trade effectively. Um, South African businesses, where we're talking about mining or industry or agriculture, relied a great deal on migrant labor. Uh, black population from territories that were predominantly uh, Bantu. And um, this was beneficial to the white population, certainly, because they could pay these black migrant laborers uh, coming to Johannesburg and Kimberley and these other mining and industrial centers, they could pay them almost nothing. I mean, just a pittance of a wage. Um, and uh, this did lead to a great deal of fear on the part of the white population because so many of these migrant laborers were taking the unskilled jobs. That they feared that you know, they, there wouldn't be any, any available for the poor whites. And so the white workers ended up unionizing, um, and the unions became quite strong in South Africa. Now, hypocritically, uh, the white population would go on to forbid the blacks from unionizing um, for reasons that we can talk about. But um, 
these unions ended up pressuring the government and the industries uh, into making concessions to the white workers. Um, there were sort of quotas set uh, dictating that a certain percentage of the jobs needed to, or that only a certain percentage of the jobs could go to black people and that the, the skilled positions certainly and many of the unskilled positions even had to be reserved for the whites and that the whites had uh, had to make much higher wages um, depending on the sector of the economy uh, in in uh, mining the I believe the uh, the white wages were on average about 10 times um, the wage of the of a black uh, laborer in industry it was somewhat lower but still uh, totally disproportionate, right? Um, and all of that was the kind of capitulation of the government. Um, there were laws passed uh, about this uh, capitulation of the governments and the industries to the demands of these white unions. Um, and under the Union of South Africa, there were sort of gradual changes. We can compare these, I think, um, uh, to the the kind of legal history um, of uh, Nazi Germany, for instance, in the 1930s, you know, where initially there was a sort of coalition government, and then by 1935, you know, they're passing laws forbidding Jews from uh, working in certain professions and, um, and establishing quotas on, you know, very strict quotas to keep the number of Jews in, in uh, certain sectors of the economy and education and things like that uh, down. Um, you know, the, the, kind of legislation in the 19 teens 20s and and even thereafter resembles this in some ways uh, except you have to of course substitute the um, uh, the black population for the the Jews um, so among others um, and one of the really maybe the most sinister parts of this whole system of segregation and eventually this thing called apartheid that would be set up in South Africa was what was known as initially as the Natives Land Act of 1913. Um, this declared that the black population of South Africa was not, um, well, they phrased it in, in a couple of different ways. They proclaimed them to be not native to most parts of South Africa. They said that, and you know, there was a kind of revisionist history or a false history um, that was <coughs> passed around by the white population, uh, purporting that the blacks, the Bantus specifically, who migrated into southern Africa, only made it there around the same time as the whites did, or maybe even a little after, is how they phrased it, how they, how they uh, portrayed it. And so the white population who settled South Africa in 16, starting in 1652, they said, were the original inhabitants. Of course, they left out the fact that the uh, the Khoisan peoples, um, try to click with a cough drop in your mouth, it's really interesting. Um, but the, the, you know, these Bushmen, these, uh, the natives of that region um, were totally, you know, destroyed and assimilated and, and uh, forced into the, into the desert. Uh, by the incursions of both the Bantus and the whites. Um, so they, they left out the claims of those people. But they said the Bantus were, in a sense, interlopers on the territory that was already claimed by the whites. Now, I'm not even going to get into how problematic that assertion is. It's totally ridiculous in so many ways. Um, but they then went on to create, and they had precedents for this. Um, they could look at the, the creation of Native American reservations, for instance, in the United States. Uh, and, and they drew some inspiration from that. They created these reserves, okay? Now, if you look at the map on this slide, you will see the shape that these reserves eventually took, all right? So these are mostly on marginal lands, all of the best farmland, uh, all of this stuff here in the Orange Free State, for instance, and down here in the Cape, um, uh, kind of the Eastern Cape, uh, which is fertile farmland, as well as the best parts of Natal here were all reserved for the whites. And the rather marginal land was labeled as <coughs> the homelands or the native reserves of the black population. And they divided these by ethnicity, right? 
And so here in <coughs> in the Transkei and the Siskei, we have the Kosa peoples. Um, up here in Kwa Kwa, um, we have the Sutu. Um, and then all of these things in purple here are what became known as, uh, or, or what it became known as Bokuda Tswana, uh, reserved for the Tswana peoples. Now notice that this is not contiguous territory, right? Uh, Transkei, which is the largest of these, has a little part of it that is sort of cut off from that, right? Um, KwaZulu, you'll notice, is not contiguous. There are <coughs> lots of different parts of this, and there are even little divisions here, right? That would have been a road, um, probably, or something, you know, that, that was important to the whites, so they, they cut the territory in two. Um, and they, you know, according to law, uh, a black person could not pass through that, that white territory legally um, because that would be sort of illegal immigration, okay? The most ridiculous one of these by far is Baputitswana, though. Um, down here, and this, by the way, uh, the, the original Natives Land Act reserved about 7% of all of the land of South Africa for the black population. That was all they gave them. This would grow over time to about 13%, but it was never bigger than that. And this is, you know, supposedly supposed to be all of the territory given to a black population that constituted upwards of 75 to 80 percent of the entire population. They got seven uh, initially and eventually 13 percent of all of the land. Okay. Now, they were supposed to be self-governing, but in reality, they were nothing of the sort. They were entirely manipulated by the white government. They couldn't um, make their own deals, you know, conduct their own diplomacy or, or trade or anything like that. They didn't have their own currencies. They were they were entirely beholden to the government in Cape Town, Pretoria, and Bloemfontein, the three capitals, uh, Cape Town, the legislative, the Pretoria, the executive, and Bloemfontein, the judicial capitals of South Africa. Um, and, you know, in Boputatswana, so the main kind of... Uh, uh, center was here, um, uh, close to Mafe King. <coughs> but this is, and, and I, I've been to this area, okay, um, I spent six months living in Khabarone here, so I passed through what had been Bukuritswana. Um This is a good, I mean, even for like uh, modern vehicles, a good maybe six, seven, eight hour drive from this area down here, which is known as Tabanchu. And I've been to Tabanchu as well. Um, and so, you know, the, the government of the homeland is supposed to govern over all of these territories, which are not contiguous, and which they can't legally pass, you know, through the white territory to get to the other parts of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd what was done here. These lands were marginal. Um, the blacks were limited in the, uh, their economic prospects, of course. Um, they were, you know, they were supposed to be agriculturalists and pastoralists, but they were given only a tiny amount of land to farm on, and very quickly, these lands were totally stripped of their the soil fertility, um, and became almost unlivable, uh, subject to horrible erosion, and uh, I mean the most um, poverty-stricken living conditions you can imagine. Uh, as I said, I went to Tabanchu one time, and and the population of these areas was often very dense. Um, you know, houses sort of everywhere, but with absolutely no modern amenities, no running water, no uh, good sanitation facilities, no decent roads. The roads are often just like dirt ruts. Um, and housing a population that was, you know, as dense in some cases as a city, um, as, a, as a major city. Uh, Kwa Kwa up here had the densest population of any of the homelands. It was something around 900, 900 people per square mile or something like that. I mean, it's just uh, kind of insane how tightly packed the people were there, and they're supposed to farm on these territories, which makes absolutely no sense, right? So the Natives Land Act was, was a big one. And, and if, now, of course, what this meant was black people who live, who, you know, were supposed to be resident in these homelands. Now, the other thing was, you know, uh, a Hosa, for instance, might have been born 
um, in East London, or, well, actually, that's in uh, Siskai, but in Port Elizabeth, or up here in the Orange Free State, or in Pretoria, or something like that. But even if they were born outside of this territory, even if they had never traveled to the homeland to which their ethnicity belonged, they were still um, considered illegal aliens, as it were, or you know, illegal immigrants to the white areas of South Africa. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, the government often forcibly removed people from places. There were a lot of squatter camps and illegal settlements and things like this. Uh, we'll talk about this as we go on. And uh, they would remove people off to the homelands. Um, they eventually passed laws stating that, that uh, <coughs> those who were supposed to be resident in their homelands had to carry identification. That included uh, information about a contract for work that was temporary. These contracts could not be held in perpetuity. They had to be temporary things, and they had to return to their homelands if they were not actively uh, involved in a, in a work contract with a white-owned uh, firm of some kind. Okay. Well, understandably, because there are no prospects in the, in the reserves, uh, the majority of the population tried to get out. They wanted to go to the cities uh, to get jobs in the mines or in industry or, or you know, um, on the farms uh, in the Orange Free State or, or something like that. Uh, um, and, you know, there was a huge uh, migration from these territories to the cities and even to into rural regions in the white areas. Um, but if they didn't carry identification, they could be... Um, they could be sent back to the homelands, right? They could be deported in a, in a, in a sense. Uh, the other thing was that there was no provision given um, to keep families together, right? So, oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the ones who ended up going to the cities, the vast majority of them to, to get jobs, and again, in the mines or in industry or something, were men, which meant that the women and the children and the elderly were left in the homelands to try to fend for themselves. Uh, the postal system wasn't the greatest getting to the homelands, and so you know, these men would often be gone for months and, and might return occasionally to bring money back to their families, uh, but you know that wasn't necessarily a sure thing. <coughs> families were broken up. Um, men were forced to stay in usually uh, same-sex hostels, and were limited in their movement. So these hostels ended up being hotbeds for, for a lot of crime um, because we're talking about you know desperate men who really have no recourse to anything, uh, any sort of social outlets or anything like that. Uh, hotbeds of things like prostitution and gambling and, and other things, uh, organized crime even. Um, and so you know th this is a serious demographic and social problem created. Uh, among the black population by this structure, right? Now, there are lots of other structures of segregation, eventually apartheid, but the homelands is at the heart of the absolute injustice of this system. Now, at the same time, as they were limiting the blacks from sort of any uh, economic opportunities, um, the government was giving massive subsidies to white farmers uh, to keep them in, in business, uh, to keep them in operation. Um, in the countryside, uh, uh, the labor situation was akin to, to slavery. Um, white farmers would, uh, you know, have black laborers, often illegal, uh, undocumented as it were, uh, on their lands, and they would provide them, you know, shacks to dwell in, uh, if that, um, pay them almost nothing, give them something to eat occasionally, um, Often work them for you know from sunup to sundown or maybe even longer um, uh, near slave labor conditions uh, in the in the countryside in particular. Now, understandably, because they're paying almost nothing for labor, uh, you know the white population was doing very well economically. Not all of them; there certainly were poor people among the whites, but uh, you know South African businesses were booming. Um, uh, given their their low labor and overhead costs and the you know the rich resources um, that were contained in South Africa, especially mineral wealth, um, but because of the economic desperation of the blacks in the homelands, there was rapid urbanization. Um, you know, blacks were moving in huge numbers from these rural territories that they had traditionally inhabited to the cities in the twentieth century. Um, and the government uh, and even 
individual businesses set up strictly segregated circumstances where blacks and whites would not work next to each other, they wouldn't live next to each other. Um, <coughs> they created in the cities um, townships, initially mostly hostels, large hostels that they would cram hundreds of workers into with probably, I don't know, a dozen men per room or something like that, but eventually uh, some modest homes, often squatter camps made out of wood and corrugated iron um, and, and little else. Uh, there were, you know, lots of blacks who still held freehold land settlements that uh, were part of their family uh, heritage from time out of mind. But the government put into place laws that, uh, you know, coerced these blacks into giving up these freeholds, in some cases even stripping them outright of these freehold land settlements and forcing them into desperate circumstances. Um, and eventually just declaring that no black could own land or their own property uh, within the white areas. Um, in other words, the 90, around 90% 90 of all of the land. Um, uh, so this, this system of absolute segregation, and you know, you're maybe you're, I'm sure you're familiar with segregation from images of the Jim Crow uh, American South. Uh, those sorts of things existed as well, you know, separate um, uh, areas of a bus or train, um, separate platforms to catch the train on, separate beaches, separate drinking fountains and restroom facilities and, and so forth and so on. All of that was part of this as well. Um, but uh, the, I mean, it, it, there's, you know, structurally a lot more that goes into the segregation than, than just that. Now, there was a great deal of black resistance almost from the beginning uh, of the segregation system. Uh, the largest and most successful, arguably, um, uh, organization was the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union. Um, this is a trade union rather than a political party. Uh, this, at its height, had qu about a quarter of a million members with a lot of probably unofficial members as well. Uh, it was declared illegal by the South African government. Um, uh, unions were said to be European institutions, and it would be wrong uh, for the development of these Africans, they said, for them to have European institutions. This is not something that is culturally germane for them, and so they, they forbade them on those grounds. This didn't stop them from organizing. The ICU um, functioned illegally for a long time, and this provided an outlet for people's frustrations, for them to organize on the local level. Um, and within businesses and to press for better circumstances, which they were successful in some cases at gaining, though in most cases uh, it had little effect on white power, right, or white supremacy. <coughs> the, um, and we've talked about these already. The African National Congress was formed in 1912, sent a delegation to Versailles after the First World War, um, and uh, really sort of took the reins as the, the leading political party among the black population. Uh, there were some more radical thinkers who began to connect with those arguing for negritude and, and uh, things like that um, and formed the Pan-African Congress, uh, whose goal was not just to create a kind of nationalist identity in South Africa, but rather to connect with blacks across the continent and across the world uh, to throw off the yoke of the oppressor. So their, their goals were much more, were much larger than just, you know, fomenting for change inside of the country of South Africa. Uh, the the Pan-African Congress uh, often went the route of radical, um, uh, uh, radical and, and violent um, uh, demonstration and uh, rebellion, sabotage, things like that. Um, before the ANC did that, though the ANC would eventually adopt those tactics as well. Um, there was also the African Political Organization, which um, was a political party not of Africans per se, but of the um, the Griqua or colored population, the mixed race group, whose culture was predominantly Afrikaans and European. They spoke Afrikaans as a language, <coughs> but. Uh, they were also discriminated against uh, under the, uh, the segregation system set up. And so they formed their own political organization. There was also a political party formed for the Asian population, mostly South Asian, Indian, and uh, Pakistani population that existed in, in South Africa. Um, and so, you know, the early 20th century saw the formation of these uh, political organizations, political parties that would press for change uh, sometimes sometimes 
through nonviolent demonstrations, sometimes through more radical means. Zionist churches also, and I've talked about these already, uh, became outlets for um, opposition, for protest. Uh, we talked about the Zion Christian Church in an earlier lecture. And, uh, you know, this was a Christian church, um, but which had a lot of uh, indigenous African beliefs and, and uh, a very apocalyptic kind of theology, uh, purporting that, you know, uh, the end times would come and the blacks would be delivered, um, and the blacks formed a Zion society. And there was, there was a lot of Old Testament imagery to this and a lot of liberation theology. Um, uh, and so, I mean, these are really exciting, kind of animated um, organizations, but without much real power or ability to affect change, given the ironclad systems that were being set up by the white government. At the same time, the Afrikaners were growing as a kind of, uh, with their their own nationalist sentiment. Um, some of this was anti-British, and some of it was, a great deal of it was certainly anti-African, anti-black. Um, they saw the blacks as, given the demographic realities of South Africa, as probably the greatest threat to their power. And so they began to try to enact uh, more and more legislation, uh, greater and greater change to uh, ensure that they would maintain a hold on power, that the blacks would be kept in a subservient status indefinitely, right? Uh, during the Union period, before South Africa was declared a more or less an independent nation, the Union was still technically a, a subject of the British Empire. It would only be become fully independent in 1948. Um, but the the main leader at the beginning of this period um, in South Africa was an Afrikaans gentleman named Jan Christian Smuts. Um, he's pictured up here with the army uniform on. He was Afrikaans. Yet he was also educated at Cambridge University um, and got along very well with the British people um, in First World War. He uh, served as a military general in the British Army, leading African troops in campaigns uh, in, in Africa, um, and emerged as a kind of war hero. <laughs> Sorry for the sneeze. Uh, as a kind of war hero. And uh, the many of the Afrikaners didn't particularly like Smuts considering him way too cozy uh, with the British for their tastes, and so his South African party, as it was called, um, ended up not being the favorite of many of the Afrikaners who began to go in a different direction, right? Uh, they formed what was known as the National Party, and they won an electoral victory in 1924, um, uh, ousting Smuts from power, but even the National Party was not considered... Um, uh, it, over time, not considered uh, to be friendly enough to Afrikaans' interests. And so one of the leading figures uh, in the politics uh, who emerged after that was a guy named Daniel Milan, or D.F. Milan, uh, pictured down here at the bottom of the slide. Um, and I'm really glossing over a lot of South African political history here, by the way. This is not a, a comprehensive treatment um, but Milan f broke away from the National Party and formed what was known as the Purified National Party. And eventually the National Party kind of withered on the vine, really with no, with not a lot of support from anyone. And so when it became defunct, then Milan's National Party dropped the label Purified and reassumed the label National Party. And, and this, you know, some of this came uh, as a result of the Second World War, and again, I'm, you know, kind of glossing over a lot of details here. Um, as in the First World War, the Afrikaners were far more culturally felt far more culturally um, bound to the Germans than they did to the British. They still remember the South African War and the bitterness uh, over the results of that. Um, and so they did not want South Africa to join with the British in the Second World War. Um, Smuts was still around, and others who were friendly to the British uh, did lead um, South Africa into the Second World War uh, on the side of the British, and they and they fought uh, in, in that war. There were South African troops, you know, sent to, uh, to Europe um, and other places, North Africa. Um, Though they did so uh, with the strict um, 
guarantee that no black troops would be uh, allowed to uh, to fight um, in combat roles. They were support troops in some cases, or served in menial positions, um, manual labor kinds of things. And uh, but uh, the, the, you know, the, even the army was strictly segregated um, in the, under the South African command. Um, and you know, the British were in, as we've said, in some disarray at the end of the Second World War. Their country was deeply in debt. Uh, they were involved in the Reconstruction after so many bombing campaigns, and they, in a way, you know, began to divest themselves of their colonies, recognizing that the empire was no longer viable. And the Afrikaners took advantage of the disarray the British were in. Now, in the 1948 election, they managed to win a rather shocking majority of the seats in the South African Parliament. Now, this was done um, in a kind of underhanded way. One of the, uh, not underhanded, but um, you know, a way that is is somewhat suspect politically. Um, when they formed the Union of South Africa, let's remember this was in the aftermath of the of the South African War, um, first decade of the 20th century, and the British were making all kinds of concessions. Um, given the PR disaster that was the, the South African War, making all kinds of concessions to the Afrikaner community. And one of the things that the Afrikaners insisted upon was that um, that representation in Parliament would not be strictly on the basis of population, that certain areas with lower populations, meaning rural areas, would be given, in a sense, disproportionate representation. Um, so as to make them, you know, to to make them smaller territory territory wise, um, and so the Afrikaners were in a way overrepresented um, because the Afrikaans population lived uh, in large part in the rural regions. Well, the rural vote in 1948 was uh, experienced a, a huge turnout, whereas the British um, the British vote uh, was less excited. Um, and the urban centers, although they did elect British candidates, um, were not nearly as inspired. Um, and so the Afrikaners ended up with a majority of the seats in Parliament. And Daniel Milan, this hardliner, um, you know, hardliner, especially in the case in the uh, in the case of racial policies, took over as the prime minister, and he began to uh, do a couple of things. Okay, began to distance. Um, South Africa from the British Empire, eventually under his successor, Hendrik Ververt, um, South Africa would break away entirely from the British Empire, even from the Commonwealth, um, and divest themselves of all of their uh, official British ties, right? Lots of unofficial British ties continued, but officially they were not part of the Commonwealth anymore. And 1948 is also seen as the beginning of this thing called apartheid. Now, apartheid is a, an Afrikaans word that means separateness. And in 1948, this became the official policy of the South African government, that the white population and the black population would be kept separate. That there would be separate laws governing uh, uh, these two populations, um, that blacks were technically were, were not citizens, had no recourse to any sort of political outlet, they couldn't vote, they couldn't hold office. They could not be legal residents of South Africa. They could only be there if they were hired by a white worker, a white employer of some kind, right? Um, and otherwise, they had to live in the in the reserves, the homelands. Um, and you know, all of the segregation things were were you know firmly put into place and underlined by Milan's government. And so, apartheid is dated to 1948. Now, the structures of apartheid were put into place in the decades before this, all of the segregation kinds of things. But we call the, I mean, the apartheid era extends from 1948 until 1994, the first democratic election, um, fully democratic election in South Africa. Now, in response to this, the African um, political parties began to change, um, recognizing that they had been up to this point, you know, three, four decades after their initial organization, had been totally ineffective at pressing for any kind of meaningful change, any kind of meaningful recognition of their rights. And 
this, you know, certainly in the case of the ANC and others, this coincided with the rise of a youth group, a youth league, in fact, which was an organization within the organization of the ANC. And those who emerged at the head of the youth league were um, a number of men, uh, most of them educated at Fort Hare University in the Transkei, which was a missionary school, a missionary university, not a uh, public school, because the South African government really didn't provide much in, by, the, by way of public school at this point for the black population, uh, leaving it in the hands of you know Christian missionaries and others. Uh, but several young, bright, talented men uh, had graduated from Fort Hare um, with law degrees and had taken up um, practice of law uh, in Johannesburg, mostly. And one of these was a fellow named Nelson Mandela. Now, he was a legal partner with a guy named Oliver Tombo, and they became close friends with a guy named Walter Sisulu. And Mandela, together with Tombo and Sisulu, would emerge at the head of the ANC Youth League and eventually, uh, certainly by the mid-1950s, take over the leadership of the ANC and press for more and more change, more and more radical solutions to overcoming apartheid. All right, so the structures of apartheid, and we talked about some of these, so we don't need to belabor the point. We talked about the homelands. Um, uh, these were, as I said, eventually extended to about 13% of the land mass, but these were not, you know, as we looked at, contiguous, um, really ways of keeping the black population totally in subjection and often separated as families um, and living entirely beholden to the dictates of the whites. In the cities, urban townships, uh, in some cases with large populations. The largest township in South Africa, and it, there's, it's, some of it is pictured here, uh, was on the outskirts of Johannesburg, and it was known as Soweto. Uh, Soweto, and that's down here on the slide right there. Okay, we'll talk about the Soweto uprising later. Um, Soweto may sound like an African word, uh, but it actually is an acronym that just means Southwest Townships. Um, though, interestingly, it's been taken as a word and kind of, you know, incorporated into some of these languages spoken in South Africa, and uh, it, it's become a real sort of cultural icon. Well, Soweto would grow up to have, you know, hundreds of thousands, probably at its height, a couple million people. Um, maybe even bigger than that. It's, it's unknown how many people lived in Soweto. I mean, it could have been 5 million people living there. Um, absolutely massive township made up mostly of these very simple three or four room, not bedroom, room dwellings. Now, there was usually a, a living area, a small kitchen, and one or two bedrooms in these places. Um, when I lived in South Africa, I spent countless hours with friends, acquaintances, others uh, in, in homes just like this um, in various townships. Um, Soweto uh, a few times, but mostly other townships. Um, so these urban townships became a basic feature because blacks could not legally live inside of the cities, which were reserved entirely for the white population. The only way they could is if they lived in um, housing provided by their employer. And most of the blacks who lived in the cities were domestic servants of white families. Uh, nearly every house in, you know, in the white areas of South Africa, uh, in the cities at least, was built with some sort of room off the back. Usually it was just one room, one very Spartan room, with no amenities, sometimes a bathtub um, or a sink or something, uh, where the maid would live, right? So the, the maid's quarters, the servant's quarters. Um, and this became just a, a standard feature, a standard, uh, you know, amenity. Uh, if you're shopping for real estate, uh, they would list, you know, servant's quarters in the back, right? Um, because they could hire uh, maids from, you know, from the homelands or from the townships for almost nothing. Uh, pay them almost nothing, and uh, uh, just give them a, a kind of a place to live and a, a very small uh, allowance, um, and uh, they would do 
all of the domestic labor for them, all of the cooking and cleaning and, and things like this. Really wealthy families had, you know, staffs of uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 people. Um, I became acquainted when I lived in South Africa with uh, a famous athlete. I will not mention the name. I actually uh, think he's a pretty nice guy, uh, although I never actually met him. I met his wife, um, uh, and she actually invited uh, the, some people from the organization I was working for over for lunch one time, and, you know, they had a whole, I mean, they had a huge, uh, huge property, huge mansion uh, outside of Johannesburg, um, and uh, they had a, a household domestic staff, of probably at least a dozen people. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's, I mean, it, it varied depending on the person. Um, but uh, blacks could only live if they were, had accommodations provided for them by their employer. They could not build their own houses or rent uh, their own houses or anything like that. Um, they could live in the townships, however, which were segregated specifically for blacks. And, and they were, you know, initially the government tried to divide them up by ethnicity. They insisted that, you know, the Tosa and the Zulu could not live together in the same neighborhood in a township, um, for instance, or that Swana and Sutu or, or Pedi could not live together. Uh, but people, you know, married across ethnic lines and, and quickly organized together, and eventually the government just kind of gave up trying to keep them separated from each other. There were very strict um, miscegenation and segregation laws. Um, illegal for a white person to marry or have sexual relations with a black person uh, or a colored person for that matter and even for a time you know illegal for uh, peoples of different ethnicities you know to fraternize too much with each other uh, lots of relocations um, seizures of you know the last remaining vestiges of black uh, owned property and uh, removal to homelands um, the, the destruction of squatter camps um, often these townships, in fact, started out as squatter camps and eventually just were kind of embraced as locations. That, that's, that's actually the term that was most often used by the whites for this was location, the location, right? Um, um, as locations for residences of black workers. <coughs> but occasionally, you know, they would just bulldoze large uh, shanty towns, uh, which squatter camps, uh, which had been built by uh, people simply looking for a place to live and uh, grabbing whatever building materials they could find in order to build residences for themselves. Um, South Africa continued to enjoy just tremendous economic growth, which uh, bolstered the ability of the white population to control the vast majority of all of the economy, uh, bolstered their ability to keep the blacks in subjection, uh, to keep this system uh, going perpetually. Um, they used, like Mobutu, though in a slightly different way, the Cold War as an excuse to keep criticism by their Western allies at bay. The Afrikaans-controlled uh, government uh, said that they were you know, active allies of the United States and NATO in the Cold War against the Soviets. Uh, on the other hand, many of these the leaders of these um, black political parties, uh, you know, took their inspiration from the Soviet Union, from the Russian Revolution, um, even in some cases embraced communism. There was a robust South African Communist Party by mid-century. Uh, Nelson Mandela himself, I think, flirted with communism, or at least uh, found some things to like in it, at least in the kind of revolutionary potential of it. Uh, uh, members of the ANC tended to call each other comrade, um, borrowing that as well from you know, these, these communist precedents. Um, and so uh, the Cold War, you know, I mean, the, the Afrikaans government was able to pass off the ANC, in fact, as a communist organization and justify their absolute suppression of any kind of political activity by the ANC and other groups uh, on the grounds of, you know, uh, commu potential communist takeover. The ANC began with nonviolent demonstration. Um, starting with the Youth League takeover in the late 1940s, uh, roughly coinciding in time, in fact, with many of the civil rights uh, demonstrations, um, you know, the Mont Montgomery bus boycotts and, and things like that in the mid-50s. Uh, similar things were going on in South Africa in the 1950s. There were, you know, boycotts of buses, uh, boycotts of white businesses by the black populations. Um, in some cases, uh, mine workers, 
uh, who lived in townships outside of Johannesburg had to walk um, as many as like 20 miles a day to work um, back and forth, getting almost no sleep um, to protest uh, just sort of arbitrary raises in bus fares and other things that were dictated to them by the white government and by the white businesses. Um, and uh, the white, the nonviolent demonstration did not work. It never worked. Um, it was an abysmal failure. Uh, the white governments, anytime the blacks would organize, they would send police to break up uh, organizations. Uh, they passed laws forbidding blacks to assemble in any any large numbers. Um, they you know cracked down on any sort of union activity, any kind of boycott uh, in the most violent ways possible. And, uh, you know, th these, these nonviolent demonstrations didn't work. Now, I recognize there's a typo here, so I'm going to hurry and make a change. I know I've done this a couple of times. Okay, here we go. Now, a lot of this came to a head in 1960. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. When worker, black workers <laughs> in a township south of Johannesburg called Sharpville, um, outside of the the city of Ferenaking, which is just to the south of Johannesburg. Um, in Sharpville, there were workers protesting the pass laws, meaning the requirement that they had to carry identification with them everywhere and they could be deported if they couldn't produce their identification. Um, so there was a, a protest going on. Um, and the police got scared and opened fire on the defenseless crowd and ended up killing about 60 people. Now, the Sharpville massacre ended up sort of leaking out to the international press, uh, became really, in a way, the first evidence uh, internationally that something terribly unjust was going on in South Africa. Um, you know, became an international scandal. Uh, the Sharpeville Massacre also convinced the leaders of the ANC and other groups that the nonviolent solutions were not working and that they needed to try something else. And so they departed from the strategies of, say, Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and there, there was, I think, some commonalities uh, between these these people. Uh, Mandela drew inspiration from Gandhi, certainly. Um, you know, some of them were in communication with civil rights activists in other parts of the world. Uh, but they departed from that to more of the radical, violent uh, kinds of solutions that were being proposed in the United States by Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad and, and others, right? Um, and so the ANC formed, in secret, a a sub-organization called Mkonto Wesizwe, which means the Spear of the Nation in Tosa. <coughs> and this was to be uh, a group um, who trained in secret, often in locations outside of the country. Uh, certainly, eventually, with the arrests of most of the leaders of the ANC, they moved their operations outside of South Africa um, at, at training camps in Mozambique and Angola and Zambia and other places uh, after those countries became independent or while they were in the process of trying to fight for independence against Portugal. Uh, that's the case, case for Angola and Mozambique. Um, and uh, they would carry out, you know, sabotage acts in South Africa. Um, uh, so this was the strategy of the Conta Way Seasway, to attack... The structures of the, uh, pol the of political power and economic might that undergirded white supremacy and apartheid, um, and you know to do this um, in as public a fashion as possible, um, not necessarily to kill large numbers of white people, though there were certainly some casualties to, to some of their um, some of their actions, but to press for change to make it so difficult to maintain their hold on power that the whites would eventually have to come to the um, negotiation table, right? That was the long-term strategy to this. Um, shortly after the formation of Mkontoe Sizwe, though, um, 
the leaders of the ANC, which let's remember is an illegal group, right? All of the political parties, all of the labor unions, all these things were declared illegal by the white government. Blacks could not have their own political parties or their own labor unions or any sort of mass organization like that. Um, these leaders were arrested. Uh, there was a, a raid on a farm in Ravonia, uh, a town outside of Johannesburg, um, where, uh, among others, Walter Sisulu, I, I believe, was um, sort of holed up in hiding. Uh, Nelson Mandela was also captured around the same time, though he was not at the, not at the Rivonia farm. Um, and the one who escaped was Oliver Tombo, though he ended up leaving the country and taking up residence in uh, the newly independent Zambia, what had been northern Rhodesia, um, but had become independent. And uh, he set up a kind of leadership of the ANC in exile from Zambia. Um and began to set up these, you know, training camps uh, in other parts of Africa to train saboteurs and and uh, members of the Mkonto Wesizwe. <coughs> so Oliver Tambo assumed leadership of the ANC. Mandela and Sisulu and these other leaders of the ANC were uh, who had been captured uh, were put to trial. They were sentenced to death. Those sentences were those sentences were commuted to life in prison with hard labor. And so they were shipped off to an island just off of the coast of Cape Town. Um, it's about a mile or two out to sea, I believe. I haven't actually been there. Um, I have colleagues who have been, but I haven't. Um, called Robin Island. And they were made to work in a stone quarry there, working long hours at some um, hard and rather pointless labor. Um, and uh, effectively sidelined, you know, for decades, right? Um, and so the ANC carried on as this guerrilla movement, again, sending uh, saboteurs into uh, South Africa from the camps in Mozambique and Angola and Zambia uh, to carry out these sabotage operations. Um, there was a famous one in the early 1980s um, against uh, one of the largest oil refineries in South Africa uh, in a town called Secunda, just to the east of Johannesburg. Um, this was this whole story was made into a movie called Catch a Fire um, with Derek Luke and Tim Robbins. It's one of, um, in my opinion, the best films made about uh, South African history, um, at least in recent times. And so I would recommend uh, that as a kind of way into this this whole world. Um, uh, but you know, the ANC, I mean, this guerrilla movement did begin to carry these sorts of things out, but they were few and far between. <coughs> and in the 1960s, there was real consolidation of power, right? Um, the whites cracked down on, on just about any action, um, no matter how public, by the black population. Um, uh, the cultural and spiritual leader of the uh, of the black population, arguably, um, in the late 60s and early 70s, was a guy named Stephen Biko, um, who uh, was the head of a student organization in South Africa, uh, an organization that the, the South African Students Organization is simply what's called the SASO, um, uh, made up mostly of black students um, at at high schools and universities, um, mo blacks were not allowed into most universities. There were some provisions at a couple of universities made for a few black students um, because they figured they would need a few higher educated people. Uh, there were still missionary schools like Fort Hare operating in the Trans Sky and other places. Uh, but Biko emerged as the, the leader of this and, and was a fantastic essayist and writer. Uh, Biko embraced this notion of black consciousness, or rather that was the, the the phrase that, that he coined, um, uh, but it's it's really just a kind of uh, regurgitation of, of negritude from the early 20th century, um, calling for all Africans, all black people to unite together, um, attacking, much like Martin Luther King did, uh, white liberals who, were, who said they were dissatisfied with um, apartheid or segregation, but who also said that there was nothing they could do about it, that they just needed to bide their time, right? There's a lot of commonality between Biko's essays written in the late 60s and early 70s um, under a pseudonym called Frank Talk. Um, 
and the, say, for instance, the letter to, uh, from Birmingham Jail written by Martin Luther King um, in 1965, right? So, or rather, no, sorry, 1963, 62, 63. Anyway, um, I need to talk to my colleague uh, who covers the civil rights to get the dates right. Anyway, uh, so, you know, there's some commonality there. Um, police and military enforcement was brutal frequently. And Biko ended up being victimized by this. He was arrested really under, under false charges, um, uh, taken, beaten, and tortured while he was in police captivity. Um, while he was, after he had been beaten nearly to death, he was thrown in the back of a police van. Um, he had a fractured skull and several other broken bones. Um, he was bleeding internally and including inside of his cranium. And he was driven around for several hours in the back of this van and ended up dying in police custody. Um, and nobody was ever brought to trial or to justice. They essentially just sort of dumped him off um, somewhere and, uh, you know, they were never investigated. There was no, um, uh, no legal recourse that anyone had uh, to prosecute anyone for what, it ha what happened to Biko and for lots of others. Um, uh, there was no habeas corpus recognized. Uh, there were even sort of secret elements within the police organizations uh, to carry out anti-terrorist actions. And let's make no mistake, the ANC um, and the, the Pan-African Congress and other, you know, kind of representative organizations were terrorist organizations. They were carrying out terrorist actions um, in this period where which witnessed the emergence of terrorism almost for the first time in the 20th century. And, uh, uh, but we have to be careful with labels like this, right? Because one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. That's not to justify any terrorism necessarily, but it is to say that, you know, I think that the ANC's actions could be viewed as justified here, right? Given the, the horribly unjust circumstances they were living in. So we've got to be careful with labels. Um, that's, that's really what I want you to think about. Um, uh, the, in the townships, uh, police effectively imposed martial law. They would travel around in armored vehicles, carrying out nighttime raids against uh, suspected black terrorists. Um, and, you know, life just became really unbearable uh, in, uh, in South Africa. And by the, the mid-1970s, um, you know, much of the kind of protest um, and uh, rebellion at this point had come from the ANC and from Nkonto Uh but that reached the vast majority of the population starting in 1976, when um, during a protest, so this is similar to Sharpeville, during a protest against the educational policies of the apartheid government, specifically a new requirement stating that every black student had to take mandatory Afrikaans classes. Now, why would that excite protest? Well, Afrikaans was effectively a useless language for any kind of opportunity outside of working for a white person, right? Because Afrikaans is only spoken in South Africa by the white population. Uh, black said, you know, black students said, we want to, you know, have other educational opportunities. We do not want to have to learn the language of our oppressors. Um, and, uh, uh, so they were protesting and again, the police opened fire, um, famously a young uh, school child, a young boy who was about 13 years old, I believe was killed. Um, there were, you know, uh, images splashed all over, uh, the international news about this. Um, let me, let me see if I can find that picture here. Okay. Um, <coughs> Sorry, I should have had this pulled up. This is one of the most famous images of, uh, I think, the 20th century. It's this one right here. Um, so this is Hector Peterson, uh, young, I think, 12, 13-year-old boy who was killed. This is uh, another student who was, you know, carrying him. Hector Peterson died uh, thereafter. Um, you know, they're running away from the protest after he had been shot. Um, and this picture was splashed all over the international news. Um, everywhere in the world. And the Soweto uprising was not an isolated thing. Uh, it began in Soweto, but eventually spread all through the country. Um, there, were, there were protests in every township just about. Um, 
And uh, the police cracked down. They eventually ended up killing, you know, upwards of 170, 180 people uh, during these protests. Um, but the, you know, the black population at this point effectively said, we're not going to, to continue to take these unjust circumstances. And, you know, many of them went into, into full-scale revolt. There were you know, constant meetings and um, small strikes and boycotts and, and uh, the continuation of sabotage by the ANC. Uh, life in the townships was horribly violent. Lots of uh, murders and, uh, and other violent crimes committed uh, beginning in this period. Um, and, you know, this continued. It got especially heated in the mid-1980s. Uh, I mean, this is, this coincides in time with the the worst violence, uh, for instance, of the uh, you know the northern in Northern Ireland between the IRA and the uh, and the the loyalists, the British loyalists there. Um, these two, you know, were constantly in the news. I remember even growing, you know, as a child growing up in the 1980s, seeing uh, almost every day, you know, stories about more killings, more violence in both, both South Africa and Northern Ireland. Um, now, to try to head off the, um, these problems, to try to blow some steam off, the apartheid government ended up um, passing constitutional reforms where they allowed, they created uh, multiple chambers of parliament, uh, one for white members, and one for Asian members, and one for colored members, meaning mixed race peoples, again, who are European in culture and, and language. Um, though the white, the number of white representatives in the parliament um, was a supermajority over both the Asian and colored house in parliament, and so there was no fear that the whites would ever actually have to make any concessions because they, they dominate the political system. But they were trying to co-opt these people. They also began to, to uh, attempt to co-opt um, some of the black ethnic leadership um, uh, who felt that you know they were more traditional. They, they didn't necessarily like the ANC. Um, and this was especially the case for the Zulus, uh, who um, had a traditional king. Um, and you know we're still sort of uh, in many cases living off the legacy of the uh, the conquest of Shaka Zulu in the beginning of the 19th century, at least culturally and conceptually, um, and didn't like the ANC, which was led by uh, a closer like Nelson Mandela um, and and these others, right? And so uh, the Zulus had formed their own organization that evolved into a political party known as the Inkata. Um, or the Inkata Freedom Party eventually. And the apartheid government began to make concessions to Inkata, gave them greater autonomy within KwaZulu um, and other concessions made to them to try to drive a wedge between them and the ANC. And it worked. There was often violence between supporters of the ANC and supporters of the Inkata Freedom Party starting in the 1980s, uh, the kind of divide and conquer policy by the apartheid government. Now, all of that is happening, and, and things are getting worse and worse in South Africa. But at the same time, other things were going on, right? Nelson Mandela, uh, who had been languishing in prison from 1963, uh, you know, in hard labor on Robben Island, um, remarkably, and, and this is, I mean, something I think so impressive about Mandela. He is one of my great heroes, um, and, you know, particularly for, for these reasons, he learned Afrikaans, um, and, and I mean really learned it. He read Afrikaans literature and poetry and history works written in Afrikaans and came to understand the Afrikaans population, came to understand how scarred they were by the South African War, for instance. Um, Mandela began talking to his jailers and befriended many of them. They, they grew to respect him. Uh, he knew how to talk to them on their own terms um, and from their perspectives, right? Um, and, you know, word began to leak out of the prison. Now, Mandela was, he was in prison. I mean, he didn't have any outlet necessarily. He was, he was separated from his wife, whom he had recently married uh, when he was in prison, his wife Winnie. Uh, who was pictured here in the bottom of the slide uh, with him. Um, 
and she was, you know, raising their family uh, in uh, in separation from him, right? So this was unbear an unbearable burden for both of them. Uh, and it, rumors began to leak out of Robin Island that Nelson Mandela was somebody that the government could talk to, someone they could use potentially as a, a kind of partner in coming to a diplomatic solution to all of the violence, all of the problems. Now, initially, the apartheid government started, they started this by bribing Mandela, okay? They said, we will release you from prison if you condemn the violence against the government and effectively withdraw from public life, right? They tried to sideline him by offering him release. To his credit, Mandela refused. Now, they decided to make life more comfortable for him, and so after 20 years in, in, in Robben Island, they moved him to a lower security facility without hard labor on the mainland and allowed him some visitation rights to his family, again, trying to bribe him to condemn the violence and to try to push the ANC away from... Uh, the tactics of Mkunta Waisi's way. Again, Mandela refused uh, to bargain with them. Now, while they're negotiating with Mandela and gradually making life more, they eventually put him under house arrest and he was able to reunite with his family and all of this. Uh, but, um, uh, or at least he could see them uh, far more often. Um, as they're still trying to bribe Mandela, other things were happening in other places. Um, one of the leaders of the ANC, a younger man who had emerged uh, in this in this period, uh, was a guy named Tabu Mbeki. Uh, Mbeki was uh, highly educated, had a master's degree from a British university in economics, uh, lived in Britain. Um, oh, another leader who emerged at this point was the Archbishop of Cape Town, um, the Anglican Archbishop there, um, appointed against the objections, by the way, of the apartheid governments uh, by the Anglican Church to preside over the, the Archdiocese of Cape Town, uh, his name was Desmond Tutu, right, Archbishop Tutu, um, and he was, you know, a, an, a, an active advocate uh, for black rights and, and an anti-apartheid activist, right, and he could do that from, in a sense, the, uh, the, the relative safety, although he was threatened many times, the relative safety of his church position and his uh, sponsorship by the, by the, by the Anglican Church uh, in Britain. Um, but Tabo Mbeki began to meet secretly with negotiators from the National Party government. And initially these were just kind of you know, talks where the two parties were feeling each other out and, and uh, trying to find some common ground. These were conducted not in South Africa, but in other places. Um, Mbeki was acting under, this, you know, under the leadership of Oliver Tombo in Zambia. <clears throat> but Abeki proved to be a skilled negotiator, um, highly educated, highly cultured. Um, he uh, dressed very sharply in three-piece suits. He smoked a pipe. Um, he really had a disarming kind of personality that put his, co his fellow negotiators at ease. Um, and so all of these things began to kind of resonate with leaders within the National Party. In 1989, uh, right at the end of 1989, the um, the P.W. Borta, who had been the the uh, National Party Prime Minister, um, I think he had a stroke. He got very ill anyway, and uh, succession passed to one of his deputies, a guy named um, Friedrich Wilhelm de Klerk, F.W. de Klerk. Uh, he became the next Prime Minister. And only a month or two after taking office, de Klerk, who had otherwise been a party line, sort of Afrikaans hardliner up to this point, declared publicly that they were going to release Nelson Mandela from prison. And on February 11th, 1990, uh, to international acclaim, certainly covered by the international press, I remember watching this uh, on television as a teenager, uh, Mandela was released from prison and walked victoriously through uh, through the streets uh, with his wife, Winnie, and Mandela then went on a world tour to try to drum up support for the ANC, gave a number of speeches um, uh, 
not only refusing to cow to the demands of the African government, but even refusing to kind of condemn any of the violent actions uh, that the ANC was taking. And de Klerk, um, <laughs> his reckoning was that if he released Mandela from prison, that, you know, they would conduct constitutional negotiations uh, and, you know, gradually recognize the rights of blacks to vote and, and withdraw some of the apartheid things, but that they would be able to manipulate Mandela and other leaders of the ANC into effectively keeping the whites in the majority of power, right? That was the strategy. And long story short, Mandela was not to be manipulated. He was a skilled negotiator. He and Mbeki um, and others, including, by the way, Cyril Ramaphosa, who is currently the, prime minister, the president of South Africa. Um, now, these negotiations over the course of several years often took backward turns. Uh, there were radical groups on both sides who tried to halt these negotiations. And Kata uh, certainly uh, tried to make impossible demands of all parties, um, recognizing their complete sovereignty over KwaZulu and things like that. Um, uh, and there was an Afrikaans hardline group, almost a neo-Nazi group, um, called the Avia Bia, um, the AWB. Um, I won't bore you with the, uh, the Afrikaans uh, name for that, but um, uh, this group tried to hijack the constitutional negotiations by crashing a vehicle into the, the convention center where they were conducting these negotiations. They took over the convention floor, um, urinated and defecated uh, all over the place. Uh, I mean, did sort of unspeakable things there. Um, but uh, all they did was really kind of make fools of themselves and make nobody take them seriously. Um, and so, you know, the Afrikaans, uh, the whites were also in disarray, um, and this allowed for, you know, the, the ANC really to gain the upper hand. And the Constitution came off, um, I mean, they had to make some concessions to the National Party, but they did that with these so-called sunset clauses where, you know, the concessions they made to them would have an expiration date, that they would expire after only a few years, and that the ANC, that otherwise everything would become democratic in South Africa. Uh, and on April 27th, 1994, uh, there were the first, they held the first democratic, fully democratic elections in South Africa, and the ANC won um, something like 63% of all of the votes. Uh, all of the members of uh, the, the seats in parliament, um, and Nelson Mandela was elected as the first president of South Africa um, and inaugurated on May 10th of that year. Um, now, Mandela would experience his, you know, share of problems uh, thereafter. I'll come back to South Africa when we talk about, um, as, as a case study, uh, in the next lecture for the period between the 1980s and the present um, uh, hopefully this has not been too much information. I know I've gone into a lot of detail. I do teach a full course on the history of South Africa, uh, so it's easy for me to, to get lost in this. Okay, um, I'll see you next time.